Subscribe our channel and press bell icon to get the notification of new video. Like this video. Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear part of a lecture about studying history. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to begin this term's lectures with a discussion of the various sub-disciplines in history. Before I do that, though, can I refer you to the handout you picked up on the way in? It deals with two general topics. The first is, why study history? And the second is, what is history? Neither of these questions has an easy answer. In fact, people have been asking these questions for as long as history has been studied. However, as you are mostly new students to this subject, and we have some students of economics with us also, I feel you should have some background to these basic questions. Anyway, it's all in the handout. I might add that for me personally, the most important reason for studying history is that I find it exciting. Our ancestors can remain, if we want them to, a mystery, a closed book, a blackness that we never see into, or we can come to know what motivated them and discover how that led to the world we live in today. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now answer questions 4 to 10. You who have chosen to pursue the study of history are very fortunate. This is a time when we can talk not just about history, but histories. Traditionally, history was seen as one subject, and the subject matter was clear. It was about kings and queens and wars. Additionally, it was about states and empires, or groups of states. This is what we now call political history. The subtopics were the parts of the world, for example, the history of China or of France. History has moved on somewhat, and we can learn a lot about current views of history by looking at the proposed lecture topics in our leading universities. In fact, you'll see that even the simplest definition of history that it is about what happened in the past, is up for grabs. Some of the more, how shall I put it, progressive areas of study are as much about what should happen in the future. One example of this is the field of postmodern history. Likewise, feminist history looks at the past to make sure the future will be different, and it uses the past to assist in its efforts to make the future as it wants it to be. Somewhere in the middle of these two extremes lie a range of areas of study which have developed over the modern period, replacing the traditional idea of political history. These are by now mostly well established. You can study social history or economic history. Social history asks about the ordinary people and their lives, not just their daily lives, but their contribution to changes in our society. Ordinary people have desires and wishes which they try to put into effect, 
and this has a massive effect on social development which was not fully understood in the traditional study of history. By the way, one area of traditional history which I forgot to mention, but which has had a resurgence of interest in recent years, is the area of military history. This was, of course, of great practical use in more violent times, and unfortunately has become of increasing use and interest, academically and practically, in our own times. By the way, there is a new series of lectures on military history in our department, as if to demonstrate the truth of what I've just said. Ethnic and multicultural history are further examples of kinds of history which, like social history, differ from the traditional forms. Ethnic history is a modern concern which concentrates on the value systems and beliefs of a people, usually a minority people, which were ignored in the rapid forward march of the rich and powerful nations and states. How various ethnic groups live together and how their traditions change and develop is the subject of its contemporary cousin, multicultural history. In sum, as I said, you are fortunate to have such a wide choice of things to study in the fields of history. Choose wisely. And finally, it only remains for me to wish you good luck in your studies. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a podcast on Camber's theme park. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to Canvas Park Podcast. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little about the park and the amazing things we have to offer. We like to think that Canvas offers more than other theme parks. Like them, we have a variety of exciting rides for people of all ages, but Canvas also places strong emphasis on the educational experience for its visitors. Not boring facts, but lots of interactive exhibits. Although it's mainly an outdoor experience, we do have some indoor activities if the weather gets too dreadful. The park's got a lovely, well-established feel. Set in 80 acres of beautiful countryside, about three miles south of the tourist resort of Dulchester. The park was set up in 1997 by the Camber family, but then taken over by new owners in 2004, who have maintained the original vision of the Cambers. It has lots of old trees, hundreds of flower beds, and a gorgeous lake. Cambers has over 45 different rides, exhibits, and arcades. All but one of these is free once you've paid your entrance fee. We charge a small fee for our newest ride to reduce the length of the queues. You don't pay anything for parking. A family ticket for a family of four works out at about £8 per person, which is amazing value. Full details of current prices are shown on our website, along with full details of rides, etc., and directions for getting to us. We also have a number of special offers. For example, if you live locally, why not join our Adventurers Club, 
which entitles you to 50% off ticket prices all year round, and a special lane for all rides and exhibits, which means you don't have to wait to get into any part of the park. See the Offers tab on the website. We've recently added a number of new exhibits to the park, and we're particularly proud of our Future Farm Zone, which houses over 20 different species of animals, from chipmunks to dairy cows. The emphasis is on getting near to the animals. All of them can be petted, and you can buy food for feeding the animals. Many of our younger visitors say that this is the high point of their visit. And speaking of food, don't let the animals have all the fun. We have a total of seven different catering outlets on the site. We're open 10 to 5.30 all year round, and cold drinks and snacks can be bought at any time during opening hours. And hot food is available most of the day in the Hungry Horse Cafe from 11 until 5, just half an hour before closing time. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now we want all our visitors to have an exciting time when they come to the park, but our first priority must be safety. Parents and guardians know their children's behaviour and capabilities, but here at the park we have set certain conditions for each of the rides to ensure that all visitors get the maximum enjoyment out of the experience and feel secure at all times. There are four major rides at the park. Our newest ride is the River Adventure, which is designed to reproduce the experience of white water rafting. No amount of protective clothing would make any difference, so only go on this ride if you're prepared to get wet. Children under eight can go on this ride, but all under 16s must have an adult with them. Not all of our rides are designed for thrills and spills. Our Jungle Gym roller coaster is a gentler version of the classic Loop the Loop, specially created for whole family enjoyment, from the smallest children to elderly grandparents, suitable for all levels of disability and health conditions. Carriages have comfortable seating for up to eight people with safety belts for each passenger, which must be worn at all times. Sit back and enjoy the scenery. One of the best established and most popular of Camber's rides is the massive swoop slide. Whiz down the polished vertical slide nine meters in height and scream to your heart's content. There are no age or height restrictions. Be careful, though. You must have on long trousers so you won't get any speed burns. And then there's the famous Zip Go-Kart Stadium, with 16 carts, 8 for single drivers and 8 for kids preferring to ride along with mom, dad or carer. Take part in high-speed races in our specially designed Formula One-style carts, but no bumping other carts, please. All riders must be above 1.2 meters because they have to be able to reach the pedals, even in the shared carts. Full details of all safety features are available on our website at www.canvaspark.com. So come and make a day of it at Canvas Theme Park. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a student, Dave, and his tutor about a project that Dave has done about work placements. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon, Dave. Come on in and take a seat. Hi, Dr. Green. Thanks. Well, hang on a minute. I'll just find the first draft of your project paper and we can have a look at it together. Now, yours is the one on work placement, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So what made you choose that for your project? Well... I suppose it was because sending students off to various companies for work experience seems to be such a typical part of educational courses these days. I mean, even school kids get to do it. But I felt everyone just kind of assumes it's a good thing. And I guess I wanted to find out if that's the case. But you don't look at schools or colleges, right? You've stuck to university placement schemes. Yeah, well, I quickly found that I had to limit my research. Otherwise, the area was just too big. Do you think that was OK? I think it's very sensible, especially as the objectives might be very different. So how many schemes did you look at? Well, I sent out about 150 questionnaires altogether, you know, 50 of each to university authorities, students and companies. And I got responses from 15 educational institutions and uh, 30 students in 11 individual companies. Great. That sounds like a good sample. And who did you send your company questionnaires to? Well, the idea was to have them done by the student's line managers. But sometimes they were filled in by the human resources manager or even the owner of the company. Right. I didn't find a full list anywhere. So I think it's very important to provide that, really. You can put it as an appendix at the back. Right. I've got a record of all the respondents, so that'll be easy. I hope other things were OK. I mean... I've already put such a lot of work into this project, identifying the companies and so on. Oh, I can tell. I think you've done a good job overall. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. I thought your questionnaires were excellent, and you'd obviously done lots of background reading, but there were a few problems with the introduction. First of all, I think you need to make some slight changes to the organisation of your information there. At present, it's a bit confused. OK. What did you have in mind? Well... You write quite a bit about work placement in general, but you never explain what you mean by the term. So you think I should give a definition? Exactly. And the introduction is the place to do it. And then, look, you start talking about what's been written on the topic, but it's all a bit mixed up with your own project. So do you think it would be better to have two sections there, like a survey of the literature is the introduction, and then a separate section on the aims of my research? I do. You can include your methods for collecting data in the second section too. It would be much clearer for your reader. You know, establish the background first, then how your work relates to it. It would flow quite nicely then. Yes, I see what you mean. Anyway, moving on. I like the way you've grouped your findings into three main topic areas. Well, it became very obvious from the questionnaires that the preparation stage was really important for the whole scheme to work. So I had to look at that first. 
and I found a huge variation between the different institutions, as you saw. I was wondering if you could give a summary at the end of this stage of what you consider to be the best practice you found. I think that would be very helpful. Right, I'll just make a note of that. What did you think of my second set of findings on key skills development? For me, this is the core of my whole project, really. And you've handled it very well. I wouldn't want you to make any changes. You've already got a nice final focus on good practice there. Thanks. Right. Now, I think the last part, which deals with the reasons why students don't learn... What, the constraints on learning chapter? Yes, that's the one. I think you need to refer to the evidence from your research a bit more closely here. You know, maybe you could illustrate it with quotations from the questionnaires, or even use any extracts from a student diary if you can, and refer back to what you've written about good practice. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Complete the notes below. Use no more than three words for each answer. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. I'm glad you all found your way here. Now I'd like Dr. Wallace to introduce us to the Arboretum. Good afternoon. Although at first glance the Arboretum may look like a park, it is a research and teaching facility that also provides a place for people to develop a positive relationship with nature. When then University of Wisconsin-Madison purchased the land, mostly during the 1930s. Much of it bore little resemblance to its pre-settlement state. Instead, it had been turned into cultivated fields and pastures that had fallen into disuse. The university's arboretum committee decided, early on, to try to bring back the plants and animals that had lived on the land before its development. Though they may not have anticipated it at the time, the committee's foresight resulted in the Arboretum's ongoing status as a pioneer in the restoration and management of ecological communities. In focusing on the re-establishment of historic landscape, particularly those that predated large-scale human settlement, they introduced a whole new concept in ecology, ecological restoration. The process of returning an ecosystem or piece of landscape to a previous, usually more natural, condition. Madison was a fast-growing city in the 1920s. Fortunately, some leading citizens recognized the need to preserve open space for Madison's residents. Most of the Arboretum's current holdings came from purchases these civic leaders made during the Great Depression. In addition to inexpensive land, the Depression brought a ready supply of hands to work it. Between 1935 and 1941, crews from the Civilian Conservation Corps were stationed at the Arboretum and provided most of the labour needed to begin establishing ecological communities within the Arboretum. Efforts to restore or create historic ecological communities have continued over the years, with the result that the Arboretum's collection of restored ecosystems is not only the oldest, but also the most extensive such collection. In addition to these native plant and animal communities, the Arboretum, 
like most arboreta, as traditional collections of labelled plants arranged in garden-like displays. These horticultural collections, featuring trees and shrubs of the world, are the state's largest woody plant collections. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.